um, as you um, realize or I found it, the definitions of what a DMOD is, what a biologic is, so, is all sometimes a bit complicated and also not really all that relevant. So we re I'm really just focusing on common drugs that we come into contact with. Um, and that um, hopefully um, you will all uh, find uh, in common. Great, so what, what I'm gonna cover is uh, what are DMARDs, um, what exactly does our immune system actually do? If our immune system, if we understand what our immune system does, then we can really look at particularly what, what particular drugs do to the immune system in terms of their primary mechanism of action and then understand what infection complications are thereof. Then how do the DMARDs impact immunity and susceptibility to infection? Um, what infections are individuals on particular immune suppressive agents susceptible to? And then how do we actually prevent or mitigate against infection in these susceptible to individuals? So a few basic definitions to start off with. Um, what is an immune suppressive agent? Well, it's really a drug that inhibits or decreases the intensity of an immune response. Um, so where do we use immune suppression? Well, particularly where we've got autoimmune diseases and where that immune response is particularly damaging and we are trying to suppress it. Of course, in transplant, um, where you are transplanted in an organ from another individual, which is then obviously recognized as being foreign, and you may need to um, suppress your immune response to that to prevent organ rejection. In some cancer, um, and in, in some cases where an immune response is, is damaging, so uh, we know that in terms of an iris response or maybe an, a, a, an overactive immune response to, to sepsis. So to expand on a bit of the definitions um, and immune suppressive agents, I describe what we define that as broadly. A DMARD is a disease modifying anti-rheumatic drug. We can then divide these up into conventional DMARDs or the DMARDs we originally were, originally were developed before the era of biologics. And these include methotrexate, leflunamide, sulfasalazine, and hydrochloroquine. And then there are biological DMARDs, so things like infliximab, adalimumab, you'll, we'll go through all of these in a bit of detail. Conventional DMARDs um, and biological DMARDs differ in terms of conventional DMARDs generally are quite nonspecific. They've generally got broader targets. They are cheaper, um, they are synthetically made, and they typically are the first choice of treatment for an autoimmune disease. Um, biological uh, DMARDs by comparison are highly specific. They generally target a specific immunological pathway. They are generally antibodies or chimeric antibodies, mouse, human fusion antibodies, or, um, or receptors fused to immunoglobulin or to small molecules. And I think originally they were called biological because generally they're produced by living cells. Um, but this definition is not really all, all that useful. So uh, conventional DMARDs, um, and other common non-biological immune suppressors includes the DMARDs I mentioned, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, and lefunamide. Importantly, also includes um, glucocorticoids, which may not be considered a conventional DMARD, but are important to include in any, any conversation about immune suppressors and, and infectious diseases risks. Other drugs that are also not generally considered or called DMARDs, but are, are kind of used in the same way um, would be things like um, as a thioprine MMF, um, we term those anti-metabolites, calcineurin inhibitors, so cyclosporin and, and tacrolimus, um, your mTOR inhibitors, so mammalian target of rapamycin inhibitors, sirolimus and everolimus as, as well. So when we, even when we look at biological DMARDs, they can also be subdivided. So biological DMARDs can be the conventional, as we know, biological DMARDs, or they may be biosimilar biological DMARDs, um, or targeted synthetic DMARDs. So as you, it all gets a little confusing, um, biological DMARDs themselves are subdivided. So if we look at the conventional DMARDs, it will be things like rituximab, infliximab, tocilizumab. The biosimilar biological DMARDs are really the same. They just 
it's just a fancy name for generic of the D, of the biological DMARD, and obviously uh, produced and need to be uh, regulated um, in in a very stringent way to to show that they are biosimilar to the original um, registered medication. And then your targeted synthetic DMARDs include um, your tyrosine kinase inhibitors like baricitinib and tofacitinib. So biological DMARDs can be um, polyclonal biological preparations, so multiple different clones of antibodies. So this would be something like polygam or um, otherwise termed IV immunoglobulin. Um, ATG, antithymocyte globulin, is also one of these polyclonal biological preparations. And then you get your monoclonal antibodies. And this is where most of the biological DMARDs fit into. So these may target T cells. So maybe the IL-2 receptor um, or TCR, B cells, um, CD20, uh, rituximab is a drug that's most commonly known. T and B cells, you may have anti-CD52 antibodies, a drug called alemtuzumab, which we'll go through in detail. Or they may target certain cytokines. IL-1, IL-6, TNF-1s, and I've included here, but there are many different um, drugs targeting different cytokines, including IL-17, IL-23, IL-5, all sorts of different um, uh, drugs or, or antibodies that are, are developed to target certain cytokines. Then other components of the immune system uh, co targeting complement, as well as um, um, inhibitors of leukocyte migration, things like natalizumab and fingolimod as well. Then there can be some fusion proteins which disrupt T cell co stimulation, things like a beta sept, and then your, your JAK inhibitors um, like tofacitinib. So, in order to understand um, the, what the drugs do, it's also it's important to understand the immune system um, as a basis. So, our immune system is really made up of different components. One is the barriers that prevent infection. So these may be physical barriers. So these are the initial defenses against infection and may also be chemical barriers. So these include things like tight cellular junctions, mucus, uh, the cilia, um, lysosome, defensins, as well as microbes that form the microbiome that also play a role as a barrier. And so any damage to these barriers results in susceptibility to infection. Then we've got the innate immune system. Um, as well as the adaptive immune system. So innate without any kind of memory um, and adaptive that can develop memory and, and change over time. Your innate immune system is composed of your phagocytes as well as your NK cells and complement. And your adaptive immune system made up of your cellular as well as your humoral response, so your antibody response. Innate immunity is made up generally of your cells, which are your phagocytes mostly and natural killer cells as well. The receptors are generally recognized broad classes of pathogens, either damps or PAMPs, um, and they are generally all the same. Your soluble factors include soluble factors include complement in the different uh, parts, also as well as chemokines and some cytokines. Some cytokines may bridge between the innate and adaptive um, immune responses. And they do not change with repeated um, exposure to antigens, whereas your adaptive immunity is made up of your B and your T cells. They are clonal distribution um, on individual cells, and they're highly specific with, with specific receptors on different clones that can then uh, proliferate in response to particular antigenic stimulation. And so this includes antibody in terms of the soluble factors as well as cytokines and they can clonally expand and, and form memory. So understanding the role of the immune system in preventing infection is important because um, if you understand what role particular components of the immune system play, when you know that a particular drug um, or immune suppressive targets that particular aspect of the immune system, you may then better understand the infectious disease susceptibilities and complications. So a good way to look at it is, is, is look at where there are a primary immunodeficiency examples of a particular deficiency in, in, in an aspect of the immune system. So for example, where there are phagocyte um, abnormalities, say in the disease called chronic granulomatous disease, which is a failure of um, ability to, to um, form a, a oxidative burst, you that is a good example of, of, of what kind of... Um, 
infections you may get as a result of, of, of any impact on phagocytes. And another example is congenital neutropenia. So bacterial infections, particularly staph, um, serratia, and, and burkholderia, as well as your um, GNBs, but also fungal infections um, and mycobacteria would be um, examples of, of opportunistic infections in the case of phagocytes and abnormalities. Complement can um, affect can be affected through different uh, deficiencies and different components of the complement cascade. Um, generally affects uh, susceptibility to encapsulated bacteria, particularly strep, um, haemophilus, and, and Neisseria meningitis, and so puts individuals at, at risk of sepsis and bloodborne pathogens. An example of antibody um, deficiencies may be your common variable immunodeficiency, where at, at some in some cases, you may have very, very, very low um, immunoglobulin levels or X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. And the, the result of this is recurrent chest and sinus infections, particularly with pyogenic bacteria, as well as gastrointestinal infections, things with an enterovirus and also um, GRDiasis. Cell-mediated immunity, an example, is chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, which is characterized by a recurrent and severe skin and mucous membrane fungal infections. But other um, infections include uh, TCP, TB, other mycobacteria, as well as your bacterial um, uh, pyogenic bacteria and also um, gastrointestinal viruses. So some in some cases, such as in particularly in, in PEDS, where you have a severe combined immunodeficiency, it may it affects both your cell-mediated and, and antibody immunity. And so there's a very wide range of pathogens that an individual becomes susceptible to, leading to generally really reduced um, survival. So what are the important uh, infectious syndromes to consider in the context of um, anyone receiving anything that may cause a degree of immune suppression? So the infections that we would consider would be generally divided up into these different categories, which were um, described by Roberts and Fishman in a nice review in CID in 2020. And so they, did, they describe it as the infections you need to worry about in the case of immunosuppression would include those chronic viral infections that are normally controlled by the immune system, but for which they are some therapies that exist, so it's mostly your herpes viruses, but also your hepatitis B and C. Those opportunistic infections that need an immune response for resolution. So these are things like TB, uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, um, other intracellular bacteria as well. Severe life-threatening infections, um, so bacterial sepsis. Then those other infections that for which there is no specific therapy, but for which immune responses are generally essential for cure and for control. So things like cryptosporidium, BK virus in the setting of, of renal transplant, um, JC virus, norovirus as well. And then your other kind of common bacterial and fungal infections that we see um, um, daily in patients admitted to general medical wards. So that's a basis from which to, to progress a bit further and to look at specific immunosuppression um, and suppressive agents and their infection risk. So I actually wanted to start off with corticosteroids. Um, that, although they're not considered a DMARD, um, they are the drugs that we would most probably use most commonly um, and for a variety of different reasons, mostly for anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive reasons, but also for endocrine and, and other causes or other uses as well. So they act by binding to the intracellular glucocorticoid receptor and they alter gene expression in order to reduce uh, the production of pro-inflammatory uh, molecules. So the immunological effects are quite significant and quite broad. So they decrease chemotaxis and also inhibit phagocytosis. They do reduce cytokine expression, cytokine production, and also reduce T-cell numbers and function. So they really significantly affect all three arms of your immune system. So your innate, your cell-mediated, as well as antibody. And, and so the infections that an individual may be susceptible to would include your viral infections. This is even at, at low doses of corticosteroid, um, particularly your herpes viruses, um, an increase in common bacterial and fungal infections and your opportunistic infections such as PCP, TB, and strongyloides. We know that strongyloides, hyperinfection, uh, corticosteroid use is a, is a particularly potent risk factor. 
But corticosteroids generally are, are really, um, their impact is really determined by the dose you use and um, the duration for which you use them. So if you look at this figure up on the right, um, at a generally low dose, um, if you look at the risk of, of serious infection, they sit kind of between, say, uh, rituximab and a, T and a TNF inhibitor. Whereas at high dose glucocorticoid, they are um, much more immune suppressive than, than those drugs. Um, and if you've got, at the one side, you've got high dose uh, glucocorticoids, on the other side, you've got your conventional synthetic DMARTs. Um, you can see that at particular at different doses, you have different um, risks of infection. Obviously, um, that's also associated with how long you treat for. So if you're using um, steroids for uh, at a dose of, this is a kind of prednisolone dose of more than 10 milligrams per day, um, for any significant period of, of time, you basically double the risk of severe infection. And when we talk about prolonged courses, we generally talk about more than four weeks. Um, Low dose, uh, if you're just using less than 10 milligrams per day, it's generally associated with herpes virus infections and other uh, milder bacterial and fungal infections. But even at a low dose, compared to people who are not on any treatment, there's an increase in one to two uh, serious infections per 100 patient years treated. So 100 patients treated for a year. And that's really at a, at a level similar to TNF-alpha um, inhibitors. Remember, at a dose greater than 20 milligrams, particularly for a period for four weeks or more, the risk of TB and, and PCP has increased significantly. And so in these cases, prophylaxis should be used. If we go back to the conventional demand, so things like hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, and leflunamide, chloroquine and, and um, sulfasalazine really don't have any significant um, increased infection risk. So we don't really need to worry too much about those if they're used on their own. There's little evidence for the risk uh, for lefunamide, but um, when it was looked at, a, if there's a, a Co Cochrane review that showed that there's no particular increase in, in infection risk versus placebo, it also included in comparison was methotrexate. Um, and for these cases, uh, the combination of a biologic with a DMARD was not really associated with any additional infectious risk more than just using the, the, the biological DMARD on its own. Methotrexate is um, a little different, maybe a little bit more potent in terms of its um, uh, infection risk, but also still reasonably mild. So this is study was a, a recent study published in the EJM, which was actually a cardiovascular study, but they looked at reducing cardiovascular inflammation using methotrexate at a dose of 15 to 20 milligrams. And they found there was no increase in serious infection risk but a slight increase in general infection risk. So they said 16.5 infections versus 14.4 per 100 person years. So generally, the conventional demands are not associated with, if used on their own, are not associated with a significantly increased um, risk of infection. The anti-metabolite drugs include uh, azathioprine, as well as um, MMF, I spoke about methotrexate as well, which is also often included in that in this kind of grouping. Um, azathioprine is used for multiple different um, indications, used for prevention of organ rejection, as well as uh, um, autoimmune disease, including IBD, and rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and MS as well. Um, it interferes with DNA synthesis and cell proliferation and impairs leukocyte function and number. So the immunological effect is really um, reduced T and B cells, so mostly cell-mediated immunity, little or no effect on your innate immunity, um, but also a reduction in antibody. Um, myelosuppression is one of the side effects and something that anyone who uses as a thiopin would, would be aware of. And in terms of infectious complications, it's some bacterial infections, um, viral infections we need to be worried about would be hep B and C, as well as your herpes viruses. And opportunistic infections are low, but but uh, risk of, of PCP, TB, and and um, PML. And when I say low, it's compared to to other um, immune suppressors. MMF is frequently used as a steroid sparing agent, um, often used in the prevention of organ um, rejection. It um, also interferes in a similar way um, to azathioprine. Um, it inhibits T cell proliferation, so it's also mostly focused on your, your cell-mediated um, T cell response, but also um, affects um, 
B cells as well. So reduced levels of immunoglobulins and also some myelosuppression, particularly a neutropenia. So effects are, are similar to that of azathioprine. Infectious complications increase, particularly risk of CMV if you're using higher doses, greater than uh, two grams per day, um, risk of other uh, herpes viruses. Uh, interestingly, it's almost got a protective effect for um, a PCP. So there's no real effect on, on PCP risk. It does have some risk for TB um, and no particular effect on, on bacterial infections. Calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, so tacrolimus and cyclosporin, they are also used for treatment of some uh, T-cell mediated autoimmune disease, but mostly um, for prevention of organ rejection. They bind to cytoplasmic proteins called immunophilins and then thereby inhibit calcineurin, which then blocks transcription of activated T-cells. So really focused on your T-cell response and those T-cell dependent um, uh, B-cell responses. So you get impaired T-cell activation and proliferation, which results in reduced cytokine production. And you may have impaired B-cell activation and proliferation as well due to that. Um, and this is mainly due to the B-cell responses that are T-cell dependent being uh, impacted. So mostly cell mediated. Infectious complications are, are mostly viral, also the risk of, 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 of TB as well. Uh, BK virus is, is quite significant, um, JC virus less so but also, also a risk. mTOR inhibitors include uh, sirolimus and everolimus. So these drugs you may be well aware of, mostly used for prevention of organ rejection, but also used for some autoimmune disease uh, indications. Um, uh, the immunological effects are um, inhibition of T-cell activation and proliferation and reduced cytokine production with reduced antibody production as well. So some of these effects you can see are quite similar between the different ones. The risks are also uh, viral, um, particularly similar um, to your um, uh, calcineurin inhibitors and um, opportunistic infections, an uh, increased risk of, of um, PCP and TB and also your non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So these are, in a nutshell, all the um, non-biological uh, um, immunosuppressive agents that are used in, in uh, generally quite, used quite frequently um, in your in the wards and in the clinics. So at this point, we'll move on to the biological agents. So I wanted to start off with rituximab because it's most probably one that we mostly are, are aware of um, and use quite frequently. So rituximab is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. So it's, it's essentially anti-B cell. It's used in some B-cell malignancies, so things like CLL and, and uh, B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but also used in um, autoimmune disease, particularly lupus and, and some vascular disease. So it's an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. So it binds to CD20, which is located on B-cells, um, and then causes depletion of those cells via antibody-dependent cytotoxicity as well as antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. The immunological effect of this is, is B cell depletion. And this de depletion can be significant for up to 69 months. As a result of depleting your B cells, obviously you're you now depleting your production of, of uh, antibodies so you can have hypogammaglobulinemia. And so the effect is really minimal in terms of your innate immune system. Slightly Im impacted, cell mediated, but particularly impacted is your antibody um, responses. And so, the infectious complications are an increased risk of your common bacterial and viral infections, particularly herpes viruses again, but hepatitis B particularly um, is something to, to note and I'll go through that in a bit more detail. Hep C and enteroviral infections as well. There is a risk, uh, I think there's a black box and warning for PML, although the risk is quite low. And also um, a, a slight risk of, of P, PCP, um, although normally, only if used um, in combination with other with other drugs. So, what are the particular complications um, that you need to be careful of with rituximab? So, PCP, um, you do need to use prophylaxis if it's used with other agents that pose a PCP risk. So, if you use it on its own, um, then 
it's not necessary to add PCP prophylaxis, but if you are using it, say for example, corticosteroids in a significant dose, then PCP prophylaxis, prophylaxis would be useful. It's necessary to screen for hepatitis B in all patients that are going to receive um, rituximab. So screening for hepatitis B would, would require doing a hep B surface antigen <coughs> and, and also a hep B core antibody. So if um, the if there's chronic hep B, then obviously your surface antigen will be positive. And if there's previous infection but has been resolved, then you could have, um, you would be core antibody positive. So if you, the surface antibody is negative, then you would obviously want to try and vaccinate the patient if you had time um, before you need to use the drug. If a patient is surface antigen positive, but hasn't otherwise required therapy, then you should give them treatment um, during the therapy with rituximab for up to 18 months thereafter. Even those patients who do not have a HIP surface antigen negative, but are poor antibody positive, should also be given therapy. <clears throat> So basiliximab, also known as Simulect, is an anti-IL-2 drug, so it's specifically anti-T cell. It's used frequently for organ transplant, mainly for induction therapy. <clears throat> it's an anti-CD25 monoclonal antibody, so that's a receptor for IL-2. And so it inhibits lymphocyte activation. So it's, it's mostly focused on your cell mediated because it's pretty much anti-T cell. Um, but it's non T cell depleting, which is different to some <clears throat> of the other um, agents. And as a result, the infectious complications are really minimal. Um, and uh, so, although it is used in combination with a lot of other potent drugs in of itself, it's not really all that potent as a as a um, agent for um, cause of infection. <clears throat> Alimtuzumab is an anti um, CD52 monoclonal antibody. It's called um, Campa, um, another drug name. Um, we've done another pro produced um, slightly different, but <clears throat> also anti, anti CD52 is called Lentrada. The indications are for B cell malignancies and also for MS and as a, a drug in autoimmune disease. So it causes um, antibody dependence and complement mediated cell lysis after it binds to CD52, which is expressed on most lymphocytes, but also on monocytes, macrophages, epithelial cells, and thymocytes. So I've had it described to me before as um, kind of HIV in a bottle type thing, um, and maybe that will stick in your in your mind because. What the, it really does mimic um, advanced HIV in terms of its action because it causes profound and prolonged depletion of T and B lymphocytes, but predominantly CD4 depletion. And so it really affects your, your cell-mediated immunity. <clears throat> so infectious complications include common bacterial and viral infections, uh, uh, hep B, hep C as well, uh, PML, high risk for invasive fungal infections and, and, and your opportunistic infections such as PCP and TB. So as a result of this, you, you do need PCP prophylaxis um, because of its effect on, on herpes viruses, particularly CMV. You need a, a CMV preventative strategy, either um, a preemptive therapy or um, prophylaxis. And um, if if patients are um, IgE positive for other herpes viruses, prophylaxis would be useful as well. The risk for TB is significant, and so latent TB screening um, should be done and treatment given if positive. <clears throat> Annual HPV screening for female patients is indicated in, in, in guidelines. And for hepatitis B, the approach is very similar to that for rituximab. So it's basically a combination of, of, of T and B cell depletion. Then move on to anti-cytokine therapies. I focused on IL-1, IL-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. So anti-IL-1 would be anakinra. 
other names or other drugs that also focus on IL-1 are canakinumab and rilonacept uh, used for rheumatoid arthritis. So anakinra is a recombinant human IL-1 receptor antagonist protein, so it's not a monoclonal antibody. It com competitively binds to IL-1. So IL-1 is the major endogenous pyrogen. So it's one of the cytokines that, that causes the fever. And it's, this is triggered via its action in the hypothalamus. But it also skews the differentiation of um, T cells towards a pro-inflammatory uh, TH17 response and also aids um, in the, the functioning of CD4 and CD8 um, cells. So by inhibiting IL-1, you inhibit immune and pro-inflammatory actions with a reduction in your TH1 and TH17 responses. But the, the actual um, infectious disease risk is not as, as significant as, it, as you would anticipate thinking of, of, of what it does. Uh, it does have a mild increased risk of serious bacterial infection um, uh, with a dose that's greater than 100 milligrams per day. And, and we, here we're talking about cellulitis and, and pneumonia. So apart from this, not major in infectious complications. Tocilizumab, um, you may have used it a lot during COVID if you had access to it. <clears throat> Otherwise, if you work in room clinics, other drugs that also act on IL-6 are cerulumab, siltuximab, and um, Although there are some differences in terms of how they uh, impact IL-6, generally um, we can consider them a class. They're used for rheumatoid arthritis as well as juvenile idiopathic arthritis and, and was also used in, in severe COVID-19. So it generally um, competitively blocks interaction of IL-6 with its receptors. So by doing that, it impairs a neutral function. It also has, a, has an impact on reducing complement. Um, it also interferes with proliferation and differentiation of T cells and terminal differentiation of B cells as well. So it has an effect on your innate um, immune system significantly, and then uh, a, a moderate effect on cell mediated and antibody effect. So when we started using it for COVID, people were quite worried about the, the bacterial infections that has been shown in some clinical trials, particularly pneumonia, bronchitis, cellulitis, and, and sepsis. Although in the, the major clinical trials um, for COVID, it didn't seem to really significantly increase the risk although that has been shown in, in the room in the room trials. Other risks are for herpes zoster and a, a more moderate risk of uh, PCP, PJP, TB, and, and other uh, mycobacteria. So infliximab is the prototype anti-TNF-alpha inhibitor um, used for rheumatoid arthritis, um, spondyloarthropathies, IBD, sarcoid, um, psoriasis as well. So it's a chimeric human mouse anti-TNF alpha monoclonal antibody. So it binds to TNF alpha. And the immunological effects really through impairment of multiple different aspects of the immune system. So differentiation <clears throat> of monocytes, also macrophage and phagosome activation, uh, reduced recruitment of neutrophils and, and formation and maintenance of granulomas. And that's the, the really important component. And when it comes to any infections that um, involve granuloma formation, particularly TB. Its effect is mainly, therefore, on your cell-mediated immunity, some effect on your innate, and also some effect on your antibodies. And so if you look at infectious complications, you really got to worry about TB, 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 and more TB, and other mycobacterial infections. And if you haven't gotten um, the point, just remember TB. So... TNF-alpha um, antagonists are, are obviously particularly um, the highest um, out of all the agents risk for, for TB. And in our setting, that's obviously very important um, to remember. Other infectious complications, obviously other mycobacteria, but also anything that um, involves um, granuloma formation or anything that involves intracellular infections, so invasive fungal infections, um, other intracellular bacteria like Listeria, Legionella, and Nocardia. Um, also an increased risk of bacterial infection, so community-acquired pneumonia, and then um, also impact on, on herpes viruses and hep B and hep C. There are lots of different TNF-alpha antagonists. Uh, uh, the poster child is infliximab. Uh, 
Um, so it's a chimeric human mouse anti-TNF alpha monoclonal antibody. But there are also golimumab and adalimumab, which are um, human anti-TNF alpha monoclonal antibodies. <clears throat> then there's etanercept, which is a soluble TNF alpha receptor fusion protein, so it's not a monoclonal antibody. And then there's sertolizumab, which is a pegol pegylated fab fragment of mono human monoclonal antibody. And so they do actually have different risks for TB, although we generally will consider them a class, and it's important to 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 always think of TB risk in that way. So if we look at the risk of TB generally, um, these studies all um, are all meta-analyses of other randomized control trials looking at the risk of TB. And here they showed risk estimate for TB um, was up to 17 times the general population, generally around about four times the general population or four times other um, rheumatological patients that were not on anti tnf alpha. So these were, this was a, a summary of, of, of clinical trials, but also um, this is looking at observational registries, um, which showed a, a risk of up to four times um, either other cases or, or um, other room cases, not on TNF alpha inhibitors or the general population. But um, you do need to think of this risk in context. And if you look at where all these registries are based and where the studies were done, it's all in areas that really had very low um, um, incidence of, of TB and and, and um, you would expect that in our setting, obviously these, these risks would be much, much higher. Also, if you compare TB risk um, between TNF-alpha agents as well as other um, uh, biologics, the risk is obviously highest for, for TNF-alpha as, as I've, I've made clear. Um, other risks may be increased, but not significantly from when you compare to TNF alpha. So this is really where you need to be careful um, and take particular uh, TB precautions. So generally all guidelines suggest screening for latent TB and treating um, if uh, TB positive. Um, and that ge generally you should treat for at least um, one month before you give the biologic if if you can. So. Um, how you screen for TB, there's there's different um, agencies or countries uh, or institutions or bodies will uh, suggest different ways to, to screen because obviously patients who are immune suppressed and also have reduced sensitivity for these different assays for screening latent TB, things like the TST and, and the IGRA. So some, some bodies will suggest a TST and an IGRA, others will suggest um, just one or the other. Uh, some would suggest a TST plus two agres, so, um, but, but generally they will suggest screening for latent TB and then treating uh, with different regimens. It doesn't really matter um, what the regimen is for, um, for, for latent TB. In our setting, you'd obviously want to also, when you are screening for latent TB, you also want to add a chest X-ray and a TB nucleic acid amplification test looking for active um, TB as well. But in our setting, you're obviously not only worried about latent TB infection, you're also worried about um, developing TB during uh, treatment. So where there is a high incidence of, of TB, your risk is not just for having latent TB that's undiagnosed, it's also for getting infected with TB during um, treatment, even though you may not have had it before. So the South African Rheumatological Association um, have got some guidelines in biologic use that are worth reading uh, uh, that uh, were produced in 2019. And so they suggest doing a TB risk assessment um, and then basing how you you uh, manage this this risk for ongoing infection um, based on whether someone is high or low risk. So someone would be considered high risk if they have any TB contacts, if they work or are resident in an area with a high TB incidence. Um, so if they work or resident in congregate settings such as prisons or, or um, uh, um, army barracks or I don't know, any, anywhere where there's a lot of people living close together, student raises. Um, if you're a healthcare worker, if there's other concomitant alcohol or drug dependence, and also people, uh, these are the guidelines, um, uh, reliance on public transport, which would really um, include most of, uh, of, of our population. So any of those would consider high risk. Um, and so this is really talking about the risk of, of acquiring TB infection 
uh, on whilst on treatment. So the suggestions for if someone is high risk, consider using um, non-TNF alpha biologics and so something like maybe an anti-IL-17. Um, but also if you do use it, um, to keep on 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 a TB parenthesis therapy, so not just treat for a defined region re, uh, period of say six to nine months to to actually keep on INH for as long as the patient is on TNF alpha therapy. For those that you would consider don't fall into any of these risks, you could uh, treat them if they are, are, are positive on any of the uh, uh, assays for latent TB, and then um, evaluate them frequently for reinfection. Um, by either doing um, frequent symptom at, uh, chest X-ray and 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 latent TB um, assays, and then retreating if required. So for other um, additional precautions for anti TNF alpha therapy, so there's, there's no particular benefit for using PCP prophylaxis, um, or for bacterial or fungal um, uh, prophylaxis. Um, for hepatitis B. Uh, it's, it's kind of similar to the others. So screen for chronic hep B. Um, and uh, you should give patients who are hep B surface antigen positive, they should be um, given uh, treatment um, regardless of, of the other indications for um, treatment of hep B. Final two um, categories of, of immune suppressors that maybe you won't see all that, that commonly, but um, the actin complement, so eculizumab is used for atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome or, or PNH. It's an antibody that's directed at, at T5 component of, of the complement cascade. And so it basically prevents the formation of the terminal complement and activation. So uh, there's reduced uh, reduction, maybe a bit of a reduced reduction in T cell priming and activation, but really is, is plays its role mostly on inhibiting um, innate immune responses. So the risk then is for uh, bacterinio sepsis, um, particularly uh, for meningococcal infections, as well as so your encapsulated bacteria. Inhibitors of leukocyte migration are things like uh, your anti-alpha-4 integrin um, inhibitors like natalizumab. So this is used for multiple sclerosis, also Crohn's, um, and also chronic uh, moderate to severe um, psoriasis. Uh, integrins are important for adhesion um, and for migration of leukocytes from the vasculature into inflamed tissue. And that's, natalizumab really blocks this process. Um, so it, it hinders the inflammatory cell migration into, into uh, the CNS and also into the gastrointestinal tract where, where it's used. So you get a reduction of your specific inflammatory cells in the target tissues, either um, in the gut um, if that's what you're targeting for Crohn's or, or um, in the CNS. And so it decreases the CD4, CD8 um, T cell ratio in the CSF. And the particular risk is for JC virus, so for PML. So the major things you need to be aware of is the risk of PML, but also the risk of other um, CNS infections, particularly herpes viruses, HSV and BZB. Um, so these are significant risks for someone um, who particularly is getting natalizumab um, um, for for multiple sclerosis? So this is this is a, a particular risk that needs to be um, needs needs to be noted. I wanted to talk about the a concept called the net state of immune suppression. Uh, we've spoken about all the indiv individual drugs um, that could be used and and what their risks are, but. Um, the risk is really a combination of multiple different things. It's not just the drug used on its own. It's also the risk of the underlying disease. Um, so if you have, we know that someone with rheumatoid arthritis or say lupus <clears throat> has a particularly has already immune suppressed without you even giving them a TNF alpha inhibitor, for example. They also may have other comorbid diseases like diabetes uh, or malignancy, which also combines to um, imp impact the state of immune suppression. Then they're not just on TNF alpha inhibitors, they may be on methotrexate plus, um, maybe on, on corticosteroids. So you need to consider multiple different things all together in a kind of term of the net state of immune suppression. And then you've also got to consider what are the infectious epidemiological exposures. And, and this is made quite obvious by things like the risk of TB in, in, in our setting versus, say, 
treating uh, rheumatological disease in Australia, for example. And then you've obviously got to consider um, individual genetics and um, in, uh, a person's particular uh, genetics and their impact on their susceptibility to infection through the role that genetics plays in, in the immune um, system. So a newer concept is trying to, trying to measure the net state of immune suppression, but it's quite a difficult thing to do. So in some ways you can measure drug levels. So if you're on, say, the calcineurin inhibitors or MMF, MMF, you could measure levels and some degree of immune suppression is quite closely associated with the levels of the drugs. But it's not that easy when you're using biologics because it's very difficult to measure drug levels and to know exactly what the impact is um, on the target tissues. Some immune function assays are useful. So if you're looking at things like a white blood cell count, look at the lymphocyte count on the diff. More detailed, you could look at the T cell subsets, numbers, at immunoglobulin levels, as well as cytokine levels. These things are not really done um, in a very uh, kind of objective and, and easy to measure way, but they do give you an idea about the net state of immune suppression. Almost a better indication is, say, a viral load when you're looking at CMV which really is a surrogate of, of multiple aspects of the immune system over control of, say, viral replication. And so uh, in the case of CMV, but there are other um, newer um, options like soluble CD50 or intracellular ATP that are surrogate measures of T cell function, for example. Some immunoregulatory genes can be measured and, uh, or can be, can be picked up. Um, and I guess we'll move move close towards this as we identify more uh, genetic factors that relate to uh, immune uh, um, susceptibility um, and then also comorbidities. But this is quite difficult to quantify. If someone is diabetic or is malignancy, how it's quite difficult to, to kind of quantify what impact that has on the net state of immune suppression. Then the other thing is dysbiosis of, of, of the... Um, a microbiome, which is becoming more measurable, but also it's really something that people don't really know what to do with once you once you get a result. And finally, some general considerations for biological use. Um, so in some cases demand a bit of caution when you're using biologics, and these are recommendations from, from the South African Rheumatological Association. So use biologics with caution. It's not saying don't use them, but use them with caution where there's chronic um, wounds, where you've had previous arthritis, aseptic arthritis and either native, native or prosthetic joint that's been quite recent. Patients with risk, with recurrent respiratory infections or uh, permanent catheters or with other reasons for having hypogammaglobulinemia. Surgery is a consideration. Um, there's some evidence that, that the risk of say, surgical site infection is increased with some uh, biologic use, but the evidence is not great and studies, are, as you can imagine, are hard to come by. But um, some people would suggest planning surgery um, between or well, at the end of a kind of dosing interval um, so that uh, you get the kind of minimal effect of the biologic around the time of surgery, but that's not always possible to do. And are, this is a table that would kind of give you a guide um, as to when you could plan surgery if possible. And then vaccination. Um, obviously, if you can prevent infection through vaccinating individuals, you want to try and do that as soon as possible. The vaccinations that would be indicated would be pneumococcal, if not vaccinated before. Um, remember to do it at least two weeks before starting the drug. And you should, if not vaccinated before, PCV13 with uh, PP, uh, PPSV23 about um, um, eight weeks later. Flu vaccine should be given every every year. If hep A uh, antibody um, negative and The response rates in immunocompromised individuals. And remember hep B, if the hep B surface antibody is negative and there are risks for hep B, it will be worth um, vaccinating. Uh, you may use a standard schedule or if you really need to do it in a rush, you can use an, an accelerated schedule, um, which is using the vaccine in Gerex B, the fastest of which would be 0, 7 and 21 days, uh, which is really not ideal, but um, better than, than nothing if you really need to give, give uh, say, something like rituximab, you may want to give it as, as um, this accelerated um, schedule and then tetanus as indicated. And at that point, I think I'll wrap up and take any questions if anyone has.
Cool. Thank you so much, Lyle. Um, I really liked the way you presented it out with like what it was indicated for, what it did to your immune system, and then what infections it caused. I think that's I don't know if that's how other people's minds work, but that's like super clear and really helpful to um kind of lay it out like that. So thank you so much for um yeah, just going through each of them and like carefully like making sure that we all understand the definitions and everything. And um, there are a few questions. I just wanted to start off with um have you seen um how good do you think that people are at uh, prescribing and giving their patients prophylaxis, uh, particularly for PCP and TB and vaccinations. Um, like, I don't know if you came across any literature on that or otherwise just personal experience, just because I don't think I've seen a lot of it, but maybe I just haven't seen uh, a lot of rheumatological patients. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I haven't seen a particular literature on how successful people are following guidelines and all that. I think where we can definitely do a lot more, I, I think in the context that a lot of these drugs are used, people are quite aware. So like say in the country, like where people, patients are getting renal transplants, the nephrologists are really good at it. Um, and the, the hepatologists are good at it in the setting of liver transplants. And um, it's, it's those cases I think where we fall down is where we're using steroids um, mm. for often unclear indications and for quite long durations at, at high doses or sometimes people are self-prescribing or giving their GPs and I think that's a particular um, area that we need to be more aware of the significant impact and I was always, always went in, in doing this kind of prep for this was a bit surprised at, at the massive impact of, of, of corticosteroid use at, at um, doses that sometimes you don't consider that high. And yeah. I think that's particularly where I find a lot of people are not giving the PCB prophylaxis, for example. Um, or perhaps yeah, even yeah. not thinking of it as a differential diagnosis in someone who's HIV negative, but um, sure. coming in yeah. with symptoms like PCP and they're not asking about chronic steroid use like that. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so there are a few questions on the chat. So Narcisa just wanted to know if you knew uh, why MMF wasn't um or didn't have an increased risk for whilst you were taking MMF, why PCP wasn't um yeah um I, I don't know the, the exact mechanism but it is it's it has an anti-PCP um action um I, I don't know the specific mechanism behind it but it, it as an agent is 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 kind of anti it prevents the replication of PCP in some way or another um, I, don't, I don't know the, the exact mechanism and, and underlying it, unfortunately. Sorry, Yana, I don't either. <laughs> um, and then someone said, where, would this be a setting in which you would use a urine lamb test um, to test for TB? So they're saying that they it's a patient who is immunosuppressed but not HIV um, positive. Look, I, th I think depending on, on how immune suppressed an individual is, a lamb is a useful investigation. I mean, disseminated TB is difficult to diagnose um, at the best of times. And uh, I don't think everyone should be using it. Like, I think they should stick to the guidelines, but we do it now and then um, when we've got patients with, say, advanced immune suppression with lupus and they come in really ill and, and we do do it. And I think it is... It is it, it's not a guideline directed, but I think kind of in, in the setting of a reasonable um, a reasonable kind of uh, risk. And and um, I think it's, it's, it's something that you, you could use. I think we should use all the tools available, but it's not something that I would say advocate everyone uses uses it a uh, case by case basis. basis it, it may be helpful for sure. Yeah, I think that it's the sensitivity that's a problem. Um, so I think specificity isn't too bad in those patients, but also the I think that the vast uh, amount of or all most research and literature is obviously has been done on HIV positive patients, um, and and I think it's a sensitivity thing. So I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't recommend doing a lamb for every person who's on an immunosuppressive. Uh, agent but um yeah like Lyle said maybe um in a specific um patient in a specific situation um people saying that was 
a lovely presentation. Uh, and then there was someone who said, um, is there evidence or advice on prophylaxis? Oh, sorry, this just came up. Uh, so someone who's on MMF who needs treatment for about two to three years or sometimes more, would you then recommend prophylaxis for the entire duration? Um, also, any steroid dose that you would recommend prophylaxis for. So I, I know you did mention that. Um, the steroid dose is, is basically dose and duration. So it was more than 20 milligrams, I think, for more than four weeks, then you would do prophylaxis. But basically, I think this person is saying if someone needs to be on a DMAD or a immunosuppressive therapy for like two to three years, are you recommending that they are on some sort of prophylaxis for the entire time? Yeah, I think most of the prophylaxis is timed with, with the times of greatest risk and then for, for a period thereafter. In MMF on its own, and it's very seldom we will be using a lot of these drugs completely on their own. So you really have to have a have a look at the kind of patient as a whole. And so long as they're immune suppressed, they should get the prophylaxis. Um, and, and as long as they, they, they had a particular risk. I mean, I, for the, I can't really give, a, a, obviously the doses of steroids and all that really depend on, you really want to use the lowest dose possible to get the effect that you want um, and minimize the side effects, both um, from steroids in terms of the metabolic consequences and the, the infectious risk. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't give more specific recommendations than than that. Um, one of the I see another question was about other place to to look for guidance on when and which prophylaxis to recommend for which agents. Um, there's a very nice um, series that was published, I think, in um, CMI. I think that was uh, published by the Exmed um, group um, for the investigation. Let's see if I. I use this as one of my references. Um, it's a whole series of about 10 articles that goes through each type of uh, immune suppressive agent, uh, the evidence for infection at um, different... Um, well, maybe when we... For, 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 yeah. When we're doing the unknown yeah, case, which, maybe we can just look for it and then put it in the chat. I think that people... Would yeah, let me do that. Let me do that. There's a yeah, good helpful. idea. Yeah, um, just on that note for like, you know, steer, uh, prophylaxis for so long. I mean just think that we we give um, TB prophylaxis to um, patients for a year and sometimes pa T, uh, HIV positive patients are on um, cotrimoxazole for PCP prophylaxis for very long time until their CD4 count is, is a, you know, is until they're immune reconstituted. So we do do this um, quite often. It's just, uh, I think we're more comfortable with giving prophylaxis to patients who have HIV, just because I think we all manage them more frequently. But um, like you said, I think that if you're um, uh, at risk, then you need the prophylaxis, but obviously you're always going to be trying to decrease pull burden and side effects and all of that stuff. And I think it can be tricky. Uh, I think, well, yeah, are there any other questions? I don't think so. Was there anything else you kind of just wanted to end off with Lau or anything? No, I, I think that's it. I'll, I'll post the, the the link to those um to that guideline that um that um, I, I mentioned in, in the chat. I think it was incredibly well received, just because we've got some prominent names on our chat saying how amazing the talk was and how um, useful it is. So I think um, thank you so much for preparing such a kind of. I think important topic, but also in a really um, concise kind of bite-sized way. So yeah, thank you so much, Lyle. Um, we are then gonna move on to the second half of our um, meeting. I just wanna stop the recording. I'm so excited that I remembered to do that. Oh my gosh, except now. Stop, there we go, amazing. All right.